Thank you for this invitation, which is really an honor for me to be here today. I will give a talk entitled Biomedical Engineering, Artificial Intelligence and the Internet of Things for Healthy Aging. Before starting, a few words about myself. I have been educated in Italy as a biomedical engineer and then I moved to the UK, first in Nottingham and then at the University of Warwick, where I am actually assistant professor or reader of biomedical engineering. Since my PhD, my main research activity has been focused in uh, applications of biomedical signal processing, Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, mainly for active and healthy aging, disease management program and uh, behavioral monitoring. But given my background, um, I like to study those things, considering them as they are, which means medical devices. And if you will come my lab you will find this kind of equipment moving from uh, uh, internet of things wearable sensors into more clinical engineering uh, uh, kind of equipment uh, the applied biomedical signal processing and intelligent health lab which is uh, the lab i am uh, directing is uh, a multidisciplinary lab uh, and this means that obviously the majority of members are biomedical engineers with different expertises in uh, signal processing, artificial intelligence, medical devices. But uh, then this is a multidisciplinary lab where, for instance, uh, Dr. Maccaro, she's a philosopher working on ethics and the medical device. Carlo Federici is an health economist. Uh, Tim Young is a, a, a mathematician and uh, Michela as well as Zara, they are computer scientists and they both work in applications of artificial intelligence in uh, the remit of healthcare. Now, with this group, what we have been doing uh, since we started? Well, we have looked at in several applications of uh, signal processing, wearable sensors and uh, well-being and dealt. For instance, this is one of the first applications we worked with Paolo Melillo, which, is, which has been my first PhD student in uh, 2011. We published this work and this was mainly addressed for the automatic detection of mental stress using wearable sensors for ECG. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the rock curve, but uh, this is a way to represent the performance of an artificial intelligence system, where actually if you are if this curve, which indicates the performer, is uh, in this corner, in the upright part of this diagram, this means that you have no false positive and no false negative. If you are down here, it means that you have mainly false positive and mainly false negative. So obviously, the closer is the performance to this up left corner, um, the better, obviously, is the performance of the uh, classifier. And now, here is where we were in 2011. And then when Rosanna Castaldo, PhD student in my lab, she started working again on this problem, she already started increasing the performance when she started. But then when she finished, her performance was really close to the perfection. And the same here, when we started working on uh, false prevention in later life using wearable sensors and uh, ECG and artificial intelligence, we were in 2015 again with Paolo Melillo and our performance was uh, still good, but uh, to some extent comparable with the ones of uh, other tests used in this field, for instance, the sit to stand test or the Tinetti test. But uh, in 2017, when Rosanna finished her PhD, we were achieving much better performance. Still, this is a much more complex problem, so the performance here are still different from the one we obtained for mental stress. But that's probably because this is a much more complicated problem to be solved. And here it is another exemplar. Uh, that's my PhD in 2010 and therefore the work published in 2011 where we were trying to automatically detect congestive heart failure using again ECG and machine learning. And now uh, Michaela came and she did uh, the PhD in my lab uh, which she completed last year and their performance were uh, clearly much better than uh, the one I was achieving almost 10 years ago. Now. Apart, obviously, from my collaborators to be much better than I was when I was in their age, but uh, probably the other reason why they performed so well 
is also because meanwhile the technology has evolved so much and uh, has become so powerful both artificial intelligence and wearable sensors that now we achieve incredibly better results if we compare our work with what we were doing 10 years ago. And for instance, to just complete this introduction, let me introduce you to our last paper published recently on uh, Scientific Reports and Nature Family Journal. Um, and this was aiming at detecting hypoglycemic events just using wearable sensors for ECG. And here, the idea is that uh, uh, sugar level into the blood, they change over the 24 hours and they have obviously some very low levels and some uh, normal levels and some uh, value which are above the threshold. And our question was, can I use ECG electrocardiography in order to automatically detect those events, hypoglycemic events, without using finger prick. And uh, using deep learning convolutional neural networks, Michaela, she did a PhD on this topic, she tried to answer two fundamental questions. Can we detect hypoglycemic events just using ECG? And the results were, I would say, very uh, promising, where obviously you see this is the level of sugar over the 24 hours. This is in particularly during the night. And when the line is below the threshold and it is red, it means that our classified correctly understood that an hypoglycemic event was going on, while actually be, uh, being green above the threshold, it means that the sugar level was into the normal range and our classified was performing uh, uh, regularly. So from this, and obviously you can read the details in the paper, we proved that with an accuracy in the order of 90%, it is possible to automatically detect uh, hypoglycemic event events just looking into a few ECG bits, obviously using deep learning techniques, quite powerful instrument of machine learning. But most important, Michaela tried to answer this question. Can we try to understand the way in which the ECG change? Because obviously, if what we do using artificial intelligence is not, only, is not fully explained uh, explainable from the point of view of the clinical information they contain, obviously we fail to work together with our colleague uh, into the medical domain. And this is the answer. Basically, uh, with this system, we were able to prove which part of the ECG signal was changing and uh, why from these signals our system was capable to automatically detect an hypoglycemic event. Now, those are just few exemplars. But I think those are representative of uh, how much it has changed this domain since I personally started from my PhD in 2010 to now when actually those technologies are really crossing the board and are now entering uh, um, the everyday clinical practice. But this is not just an isolated phenomenon. My point here is that if we look back, let's say 200 years ago, to the way in which medicine was delivered, and then we consider how we do medicine nowadays, honestly, can you, can you really see any difference? Because I really cannot. I mean, here we have a medical doctor, here we have probably a medical doctor, here we have three nurses, and the same here we have several nurses, and in the middle of the scene is the patient, and here obviously is the patient. So the main actors have not been changing, but what has really been changing so far has been the environment and the tools which we use in order to deliver medicine. And that's what it is, the result of biomedical engineering, which is medical devices, which obviously include also medical softwares and therefore artificial intelligence. And if I think at the present, in this moment when I think to medical device, I have to include in this definition a huge variety of different objects, from very simple condoms to very sophisticated positive emission tomography or more complicated devices such as implantable devices for different functions. And now, if I want to get an impression of the future, what can I do? Well, if I just look into the number of patent applications per year, now, those are the numbers of patent applications over the last 10 years for drugs and biotechnologies, and they are really doing very well, about 6,000 novel patent applications per year. And this is actually the number of novel patent applications per year only in Europe for medical devices, medical technologies. 
and we are now, those that are not the latest, in the order of more than 15,000 novel IP patent applications per year. And this means more than 1,000 per day, which means basically that uh, in, in the last hour where you were attending those uh, very interesting sessions, what we had is that uh, about five novel patent applications have been filed in the last hour while you were following this session. And this means that uh, this is uh, resulting in a huge number of ideas which potentially will become medical device. This information has to be combined with another really important information, which is the time to the market is becoming shorter and shorter. More than 10 years ago, we were saying that the time to the market was about 10 years from the patent filing to the innovation arriving to the market. Now this timing is shrinking. So especially in the domain of digital health, we account this time to be in the order of one, eventually two years time. And now if you combine those two informations, the number of applications per year, plus the time they take to arrive to the market, what we are going to face is really a tsunami of medical devices. So if we already have seen how much medical devices have been changing the medicine from how we perceive it to 200 years ago, this is probably a good proxy for estimating how medicine will be changed by medical devices and this very interesting knowledge in the forthcoming years. And this will also affect, obviously, management of uh, chronic conditions, therefore elderly. Now, in response to those numbers, the World Health Organization stated clearly that uh, trained and qualified biomedical engineers are required for better design, evaluation, regulation, and maintenance of medical devices into the NHS. And the European uh, institutions reacted to this uh, uh, statement with a very interesting document uh, uh, which actually stated that modern medicine predominantly is securing important advances through the use of products of biomedical engineering, which means medical devices, which according to the uh, novel regulation uh, European regulation of medical device. This includes also medical software, which means also artificial intelligence. Uh, you can find this document into the European Union journal. Now, and what it is doing the European Commission in this regard? Well, I just took uh, uh, the last calls, which uh, I consider to be relevant for the domain of uh, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, big data and artificial intelligence for health. And if I look at the projects which have been financed by uh, the calls, the four calls that I just highlighted, they are nine, but they account for a total investment of about 150,000 um, million of euro for the next three years. Those projects started, uh, well, active ages are already going to finish, but then Gatekeeper started in October and all the other have been starting uh, since October to now and they will last for about three years, three years and a half. And this is a very interesting moment because those nine projects are really changing the way in which we support active and healthy aging, the way in which we manage chronic conditions in Europe and the way in which we support and administer prevention programs for later life in European countries. And they all have in common three key enabling technologies. Internet of Things, wearable sensors, ambient, ambient sensors, artificial intelligence, which include machine learning, and uh, big data uh, analysis, management, and presentation. So keep open eye on those nine projects. They are, you can find information uh, in the open day uh, websites and uh, those nine projects together will be shaping the way we manage later life in Europe. Now, for later life, we don't mean necessarily a pathological state. We need to consider that uh, the majority of senior European patients, they can well be in a good and dealt shape. But what we need to avoid is that they move from this healthy condition to a condition in which they have uh, uh, a risk factor, let's say um, a low complexity hypertension, for instance, which is still fine, to the stage in which they start developing some complication, to the stage in which they really become a severe patient in need of uh, complicated case management. Why this is important? Because this transition is not equivalent. 
Those data have not been published, but from uh, uh, preliminary work and uh, assessment which have been conducted within Gatekeeper project, well, the point is that this transition is the one which absorbs a huge amount of money. So to manage patient in this state as an annual cost, to manage patient in this case, in this state means to spend three times more per patient per year, circa. This is just an estimation. But this is to give you an idea and to clearly understand together where do we need to use this kind of technology in order to make uh, what I would define secondary prevention for later life, in order to avoid that more severe complications uh, affect uh, a population which otherwise can be easily managed with uh, unaffordable expenses. And this is e even more important if we consider that uh, uh, the number of European citizens in uh, this uh, range of age is growing at a very, uh, I would say, unsustainable rate unless we do intervene with some uh, technology. Clearly, introducing technology for those kind of problems presents several barriers, which uh, I just used one recent literature review on that. This is not my favorite, it's just probably the most comprehensive one. I'm not one of the other, but I must say they did a very interesting job. And they um, tried to capture the barriers from different perspectives. For instance, the patient, clearly the fact that uh, um, they have an age in which uh, uh, it's uh, not obvious that they are familiar with uh, uh, those kind of technologies and then the level of education can be another barrier to the introduction of those technology, their literacy with the health. But to some extent, those are problems that, yes, okay, we can try to face using uh, uh, specific programs or we can just wait because by the time those in our age will become in need of those kind of assistance, probably the population and the characteristic of this population will have completely been changed. So probably here we have something to do, but time will probably solve alone this problem. And obviously we can make a technology which is more user friendly. But then where we can interfere is for instance here. So what are the barriers which refrain the adoption of those technology from the perspective of staff and the NHS? Well, there are several, but the main two are technological and resistance to the change. And then there are other, which I will comment later. Uh, I must say the commission is doing a great job to tackle some of those problems, for instance, such as uh, interoperability or poor design. Those are now considered medical devices and uh, the latest medical device regulation is very clear about how to design a medical device. And then obviously even licensing and patient perception may reframe the adoption to some extent at different national health levels, but uh, national health system. But where I think uh, we can do more together and where I think the input of scholars to policymakers is really important is probably in these last domain of factors, organizational. That's where policymaker may intervene in order to remove those barriers. Obviously there is the cost, but uh, those costs are going down, but cost is a problem if and only if you introduce technology without changing the way health is delivered nowadays. Reimbursement, that's really important. We need to work together for introducing novel reimbursement strategies for prevention. Doesn't matter if it is uh, technology enabled or not, but if we will not put in place clear mechanisms for reimbursing prevention uh, programs, then it will never be possible to see in our country those kind of programs to be really uh, employed by patient. And then obviously there are several other problems such as legal liability, data protection, data security, but in this domain, the commission is already doing a great job. So, few take home messages. Technology is there. I just gave a very little understand, well, impression of how much we have changed our effectiveness in the last 10 years, just focusing on my work in my lab. But uh, there are still some barriers and on some of those, the European Commission is doing a great job. And for instance, cost, I mean, substantial co-investment, as I have demonstrated, the legal aspect, GDPR, medical device regulation are going in this direction. Interoperability, many of those projects, they have defined novel communication protocols to make the solution practically plug and play. So they will be able to facilitate communication 
a different level, but where policymakers should still invest a lot of energy in collaboration with scholars, clinicians and patients is probably in those four points. First of all, reconsidering the organization of the NHS. We have seen that we are going to face a tsunami of medical devices and still we don't see enough biomedical and clinical engineers in place in our hospital. We are mentioning the hospital with thousands of beds with just one biomedical engineer. That's not sustainable. Reconsider the organization of national agencies for health technology assessment. If I cannot assess, I cannot uh, do the appraisal and therefore I cannot reimburse. Nowadays, those agencies are still good uh, uh, full uh, with experts which have a background in drugs, which is fine. But as I have demonstrated before with few numbers, the scene is completely changing. Those agencies need to be empowered with uh, those which have experience in medical devices, which by definition are biomedical engineers. And then we need to make an effort together to harmonize reimbursement strategies across different European countries and uh, introduce clear reimbursement strategy for technology enabled or not prevention programs. Well, thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take a few questions if at all possible. Thank you.